epithelial cells make up the lining of your bladder and urinary system. Cancer can occur in those cells. Upper tract urothelial carcinoma, or UTUC, is a rarer form of cancer that impacts the urothelial cells in your kidneys and ureters. It is like other forms of bladder cancer, but UTUC can present additional challenges for treatment because of the location and functions of the upper urinary tract. Beacon is delighted to welcome MD Anderson urologist, Dr. Serena Martin, and, doc and medical oncologist, Dr. Matthew Campbell, and urologist Dr. Kate Murray from the University of Missouri Medical Center for this discussion on how UTUC is similar and different from other forms of bladder cancer in its diagnosis and treatment. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Mateen. Hello everybody, I'm Serena Mateen. I'm uh, very pleased to be here. Um, thank you for that introduction, Morgan. And I'm also very uh, pleased uh, that my um, terrific colleagues, Dr. Matthew Campbell and Dr. Katie Murray are able to join us as well. Um, I think you should be able to see my screen at this point. Um, what we thought we'd do for today is, uh, uh, first of all, keep it conversational. Uh, you hopefully hear the three of us uh, chatting a little bit, um, asking each other questions. Um, I'm going to give you a brief introduction and overview, uh, including the anatomy and some uh, disease aspects. Um, Dr. Katie Murray will talk to us about uh, some of the uh, surgical and endoscopic treatments that we have available. And then Dr. Campbell will talk to us about the role of chemotherapy and immunotherapy for this disease. And so uh, basically the, uh, up when, we, when we talk about upper tract urothelial carcinoma, we're referring to everything being above the bladder. Um, so in this figure, you'll see the bladder uh, at the bottom there. And you can see everything that's in yellow essentially reflects the urinary tract. Uh, and the lining of the urinary tract, as Morgan mentioned, is where these cancers arise. Um, as I'll show you in the next slide, the majority of these of the urothelial cancers arise in the bladder, <clears throat> and we call it bladder cancer for short. But technically, it's a urothelial cancer because it's arising from the lining of the urinary tract, which we call the urothelium. That same lining extends up the ureters. And as you can see, the ureters go all the way up um, uh, to the what we call the upper retroperitoneal area. Uh, and then these divide up into these multiple channels within the kidney. And so that's still all the urinary tract, and it's still all lined by this urothelium. And so cancers that arise in the ureter or in the renal pelvis or in what we call these calyces, um, all of these are considered urothelial cancer, but because they're occurring above the bladder, we call it upper tract urothelial cancer. And these are some pictures from endoscopy uh, that show you what these look like sometimes when they're smaller. Uh, this bottom picture shows you the view from uh, when we're doing ureteroscopy. Now, one thing that I frequently find myself doing with new patients um, is that I have to explain that this is not kidney cancer. Uh, the patients get confused and quite honestly, even doctors get confused because these cancers, since they're arising within the renal pelvis, which is inside the kidney, um, people mistakenly think that that might be kidney cancer. And so they look up on the web um, and get all this information on the internet about kidney cancer. And then they come see us. And then we're telling them all this information that they have not heard and did not read about. And then we have to explain where the confusion may be arising from. So as, as probably most of you who are tuning in are aware, um, but some of you may not know, kidney cancer is a completely different cancer that arises from this fleshy part of the kidney. It's genetically completely drift different, um, the, and the treatments that we render are uh, different, and the way it behaves biologically, also it's very different. Uh, uh, Dr. Murray, is there anything here that you wanna highlight based on conversations you've had with patients that you think our audience may want to know? Yeah, I, I think that you made a great point. You know, sometimes um, what I will talk to patients is, is, is kind of describe, you know, the outer part of the kidney as being kind of the meat of the kidney, of a traditional kidney cancer. 
versus this inside lining, right? And so uh, the inside lining of the ureter, the inside lining of these, um, you know, he was pointing at these these yellow, um, you know, calyces in the kidney, kind of looking like your fingers would be look, you know, kind of like this. Um, and then that's also the inside lining of the bladder. And so that's that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about this upper tract cancer. Matt, anything from your end? Yeah, I, I mean, I just like to draw it out for my patients. And I basically say that you have this, the kidney serves as the filter, and then you have your funnel system that connects to this tube. And this is the delivery system, the bladder is the storage system, and the urethra is the elimination. And it's just a waterproof system, not intended to secrete or absorb, but just a delivery storage elimination system is how I explain it. And, and normally, uh, and then I, I stress again, this is a very different cancer than kidney cancer, which I see in my clinic as well. Yeah, thank you both, great comments. And so uh, there are some unique aspects about this disease. Um, it is not very common at all. Of all the urothelial cancers we see, of course, most of them are bladder. Five to 10% are of this upper tract, um, uh, are in the upper tract. Um, overall incidence is two per 100,000 in Western countries. And I think that one definition of a rare cancer is um, four in 100,000 or less. So this meets most of the criteria for being a rare cancer. Uh, there's already been a question about whether it can start in the bladder and um, the answer is yes. And you can see uh, with some of these other boxes, we see them happening what we call synchronously or at the same time, about 17% of the time. On the other hand, uh, about two to 4% of bladder cancer patients uh, can develop upper tract disease. So it's not very common but there are some bladder cancer patients that may be at higher risk than others. Um, in patients who do have upper tract cancer and, and whom we treat it, there is a higher recurrence rate in the bladder, mostly if it helps to think about it, I guess, because the bladder is the most downstream and things can sort of trickle down and, and seed, but also the disease can start anew in the bladder as well. Now this says 22 to 47%, uh, with some of the newer methods that we have, which involves giving chemotherapy washes in the bladder during, or excuse me, after treatments, uh, we're able to reduce this to less than 20%, but still have not gotten to a point where we can completely eliminate that risk. And then one other thing that's different than bladder is that most of these, when they present, are invasive at diagnosis, which is the opposite of what happens with bladder, which is most of them are not invasive. And then this table um, summarizes some of the major differences between bladder and upper tract cancer. So in many ways, they're, they're very similar. If you ask a pathologist to look at them under the microscope, uh, phenotypically, as we say, or by visual inspection, they, they look very similar. But when we get down to practical levels, and then when we start probing uh, more uh, uh, molecular aspects of it, we find that there actually are some differences. So with bladder, we have, for example, tons of evidence and lots of high level data with upper tract disease, we don't. Uh, the other interesting thing is that we do see a higher proportion of women with upper tract disease. We'll see with bladder, uh, it's four to one male to female ratio. Uh, with upper tract, it's two to one. So it's still mostly males. Uh, but overall, much, many more females proportionally than with bladder. Uh, we do see Lynch syndrome, which is an inheritable genetic syndrome, is strongly associated with upper tract cancer and much less so with bladder. We think overall, maybe about 4% of patients with upper tract cancer may have Lynch syndrome, but this is an area that we're still uh, exploring. Uh, when we deal with bladder cancer, we can reasonably stage it between uh, a TURBT, which Dr. Murray is going to talk to you about, um, examining patients under anesthesia or EUA, and then with CT scans. Um, it is much more imprecise when we're dealing with upper tract disease because we're looking at such smaller resolution, uh, much smaller organs. And current imaging 
is, is at the limit uh, of being able to tell us sometimes, you know, things that are happening at the millimeter level, which is sometimes what's going on with this disease. Intracavitary therapy is treatments that we drip in, like for the bladder, um, and that's essential in the management of bladder cancer, like with BCG or chemotherapy. A bladder is perfect because you put something in it, it's a storage organ, and it'll sit there. Well, the upper tract is not meant to be a storage organ. It's meant to conduct, as, as Dr. Campbell so nicely uh, worded it, um, and it's a funnel. So things don't necessarily stick around to do their treatment job, and that makes it challenging. Um, we think removing lymph nodes for upper tract disease is important, but there's controversy. Um, and if you come to our meetings, you'll hear people, people argue strongly one way or another, but in the role, so the role is still unclear. And then, as I mentioned, from a molecular perspective, what's really interesting is this molecule called FGFR3, which plays a very minimal role with bladder cancer. But in upper tract cancer, um, the majority of them, at least with low grade cancers, uh, have this mutation. And then there's some other details about this uh, that we're finding out in terms of their molecular subtypes, but this is still an evolving uh, area. Matt or uh, uh, Katie, did you have anything you wanted to add to this? I, I didn't mention tobacco. Um, that's very similar between both of them. That of, is, of course, our single strongest uh, risk factor for both. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, I, I didn't include that. It's not necessarily different, but that's still also a risk factor for, for both diseases. I wanted to show this um, guideline from the uh, NCCN, because as you'll notice here, um, it tells you if it's non-metastatic, you don't see staging. And again, staging for this disease is very difficult. We don't necessarily work hard to talk about staging, although we do more and more talk about risk stratifying patients. Uh, but nevertheless, what a lot of people do is really think about it in terms of low grade or high grade disease. And the grade is assigned by the pathologist when they look at the cancer under the microscope. And essentially what I tell patients is that it's a measure of its aggressiveness. So low grade is low aggressiveness and high grade is high aggressiveness. From that, we can make some assumptions about the possibility of what the stage is. So low grade, for example, almost always is not invasive and it's low stage. High grade, on the other hand, has about a two out of three chance of being invasive to some degree. And as you can see, the treatments are somewhat different. With low grade, we can look at kidney preservation, and you're going to hear a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And sometimes if it's a lot of tumor, we'll have to still do surgery to remove the kidney and the ureter. On the other hand, if it's high grade, kidney preservation is really not a good option. And not only are we looking at surgery, but sometimes we're also looking at having to add chemotherapy before or after. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and, the, and the reason for that, again, the grade being such an important part of it is reflected in these charts, which just broadly, if you look all the way to the left, the grade one or low grade, you know, these curves are overall very favorable. Um, and then if we look overall for here for grade three or high grade disease, uh, you can see that the curves, especially the, um, the red ones indicate patients who had kidney preservation and endoscopic management. And high grade disease does not do well for that at all. And so, um, uh, and that's why we have to treat these very differently. And so you're going to be hearing about that um, over the next several uh, discussions from Dr. Murray and Dr. Campbell. And so from that, I am actually going to uh, turn it over to Dr. Katie Murray, unless one of the two of you has some comments that you wanted to add at this point. 